Professor Dawkins, thank you very much for joining us. Two years ago, you wrote the first volume of your autobiography, An Appetite for Wonder, and now you're about to come out with the second volume, which covers the second half of your life. Uh, your first book covered your growing up in uh, colonial East Africa, and then you moved to the UK, and it ended with the publication of A Selfish Gene, a book that made your name and made you a public figure. Could you briefly recapitulate for us exactly what the idea behind the selfish gene is. For Darwin, the individual organism was the unit of natural selection. Individuals worked hard to survive and reproduce. Reproduce means pass on genes. What I did was to put the focus on the gene as putative agent, to say, um, what would I do if I were a gene, trying to maximize my chances of getting into the future? But the idea of the selfish gene remains a hypothesis. Is there any way of getting evidence that it is, in fact, the unit for, of Darwinian selection? I'm not sure I'd call it a hypothesis, because a hypothesis is something which perhaps competes with something else, and you, you go out and look for evidence to support one or the other. Um, I would rather say the idea of the selfish gene follows logically from the whole neo-Darwinian synthesis of the 1930s of people like Fisher and Haldane. C.P. Snow, about 50 years ago, came up with the idea of there being two cultures, and he lamented the fact that the humanities and science, uh, you know, lived in worlds apart, and a lot of the world's problems could be explained by this gap. He later on added that uh, the third culture could be emerging. Do you think we are in the midst of a very robust third culture, or is there a lot of work to be done? Um, I think they are coming together. Uh, I think the third culture is flourishing in America uh, and in Britain as well. I think there is a lot of work to be done, and it's exciting work. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting to, to be building this. The United States must be an interesting destination for you. It has a large number of uh, people who uh, are very evangelical or uh, strong believers in religion uh, and at the same time it has some of the best universities in the world and a lot of great minds. What is your experience like lecturing yes. there? Um, the United States is beyond doubt the leading scientific nation in the world ever uh, and uh, flourishes. It also has, as you've said, uh, it's dragged down in a way by the sort of other half, um, which is the fundamentalist, uh, not quite majority, but, but not far from 50%, um, who actually believe absurdities like that the world is only a few thousand years old. In a way, the wonder is that America is the leading scientific nation, despite having this incubus round its neck um, of, of a, an uncultured, ignorant, almost majority. Um, you can't help wondering what it would be like if we didn't have that, that burden. Um, when I go to America, uh, I tend to interact, I suppose, mostly with university people. Um, I give talks, um, often in the Deep South, and uh, get a very, very good reception there. I get perhaps my best reception in the so-called Bible Belt. For reasons you can guess, I mean, I think the people who come are the beleaguered minority, uh, and they show really rather touching gratitude when people like me go to their, to, to go to Arkansas or, or, or Georgia, whatever it is. But presumably you face a lot of hostility as no, well. No, I don't. No? Um, I get a lot of hostil hostile mail, but they don't come to my hmm. lectures. I wish they would. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind having, a, having an argument. Um, but they don't come. They, they stand outside and hand out leaflets. They don't actually come in. One of the points you've made continually is the joy and the beauty of science and appreciating the natural world in its detail. And John Keats took uh, Newton to task for uh, unweaving the rainbow, for breaking it down into mere physical properties, mm -hmm. and that gave you the title for mm -hmm. one of your books. Could you elaborate a little bit on this point that you have uh, yes. talked about before? Um, I, I love John Keats, and uh, he and he very eloquently um, expresses the sort of romantic, poetic vision. 
Um, my book, Unweaving the Rainbow, is a, is a solid attack on the idea that when science unweaves the rainbow or explains a, a anything else about, about the world, that, that removes the poetry. I think quite the contrary. I think it increases the poetry, enhances it. Um, and many other scientists feel the same. I mean, Carl Sagan, perhaps most eloquently, expressed the view that science is a fertile field for poetry, for the poetic vision. And I feel that very strongly. I, I hope it comes through in all my books, but Unweaving the Rainbow is one where I made it explicit. People have said that religion gives them that similar sense of joy that science gives some people. And perhaps religion seeks to answer a different question that science is trying to get at, which is what makes a life worth living? What is a good life and how should one lead one? Would you agree with that? And if so, do you think there is a place for religion on that basis? In past centuries, I suppose religion did attempt to do the same thing as science, and, and is, at least the more sophisticated theologians are now giving up on that. And so they are, as it were, reduced to well, perhaps reduced is the wrong word, um, to, um, as you say, giving, giving life meaning. Um, I recognize that some people do get meaning fr from it. I, I don't think it's a very profound meaning. I think um, that you can get meaning from all sorts of other things, from human love, from music, from poetry, and from science. Uh, and I think there is a deep poetic satisfaction in the scientific understanding of the universe in which you, you live, the world in which you live, um, the, the life of which you're a part, uh, I think you're missing something poetic and deeply satisfying if you uh, live out your life without ever really understanding what there is to understand, which is an enormous amount we now know and more yet to be understood later, of course. Um, so I, I, I'm sceptical of the idea that that religion gives you very much in the way of meaning to your life. But perhaps it gives consolation. That's what people have argued, just as, say, a work of literary fiction gives you consolation or a fine opera, which is not true and has no basis in truth, but it stirs you, it moves you, it uh, appeals to you uh, in other ways. So is there room, therefore, for science and yes. religion to... I mean, and sort of in the same spirit as the mm. as, as a great novel or poetry or mu music does, I, I suppose that, that could be the case. Once again, I'm sceptical that it is, is very profound. Consolation, the other kind of consolation religion gives you is um, removal of fear. Uh, if, you, if you think you're not going to die, if you think your loved ones who have died are still up there looking down on you and you're going to meet them again, I can see that would be consoling whether it's true or not, you can be consoled by a falsehood. Um, I, 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 I don't think I would get much consolation from being from a falsehood. Um, moreover, of course, the other, the other side to life after death is you might go the wrong way. And, and a, a lot of people go to their deaths terrified of what's going to happen to them. In your book, Selfish Gene, you wrote, I think that a new kind of replicator has recently emerged on this very planet. It's still in its infancy, but it's staring us in the face and achieving evolutionary change at a rate which leaves the old gene panting far behind. You call this new gene a meme, which was a agent for cultural transmission. Could you elaborate a little on that idea? Yes, it, it, a way, it, it goes back a little bit to the question you asked me earlier about life on other planets and does it have to be based on genes. I wanted to make the point, uh, having got to the end of the self Sheet first edition, that although there has to be a replicator at the base of Darwinian selection, it doesn't have to be DNA. Uh, and I even said, maybe if we go to other planets, it'll be something else. But then I said, maybe we don't have to go to other planets. There may be one staring us in the face here, the meme, the unit of cultural inheritance. Given that gene, genetic selection, has given us brains and given us society, uh, there, are, there is a kind of replicator staring us in the face which can spread from brain to brain um, and also into inanimate media like tapes and, and the internet and, and, and books um, and then get back into brains again. Um, and to the extent that it functions as a replicator, to the extent that it has a high fidelity chance of getting from one brain to another and 
which many do, of course, uh, and less certainly has a chance of mutating on the way, and therefore of being selected for its transmissibility. Uh, if, it's, um, if it's a tune, for example, a catchy tune is more likely to get propagated from brain to brain than a boring tune. Um, the French national anthem is a better tune than the British national anthem and is more likely to get whistled in the street. Um, so uh, memes may be subject to some kind of Darwinian selection in their propagation through the memosphere, through the, through the culture. Um, I never really intended that as a contribution to the science of human culture. For me, it was just a way of illustrating what an alternative to the gene might look like. Uh, and if, if computer viruses had been invented at the time, I'd have used that probably. On that basis, though, could you argue that religion is one of the most powerful memes around? It yes, has been you could. transmitted for generations, it's yes. still enduring. Yes. And just to stretch this metaphor a little bit, in what sense would this meme, religion, be contributing to human evolution? I know it's a very short span of time so far, but do you have any speculation about in what way it has conferred any advantage to the human race, if any? Well, uh, it, it, if you generalize evolution to include mimetic evolution, then it, sort of by definition, if you're, if you're saying it is a meme, then it's clearly evolving um, and actually probably evolving to get better at it. I mean, you could say that a, a long established religion, like say Roman Catholicism, has over centuries got better at it, got better at propagating itself. Um, so that could be a form of, of Darwinian evolution. Um, but I think what you are asking is whether um, it also contributes to genetic evolution, whether, it also, whether um, the fact that we are evolving in an environment dominated by religion does actually um, affect differential gene survival. Um, well, I suppose that if there's a meme that says um, don't use contraception or don't use contraception that works, um, then that does tend to um, affect uh, gene propagation, obviously. Um, so that's the kind of thing that might be going on. But remember that genetic evolution is a very slow process. You mentioned this yourself. Uh, genetic evolution is a very slow process compared to cultural ev evolution. and so. We're dealing with two rather disjoint timescales here. A lot of people have been quite surprised that you haven't received a knighthood yet. <laughs> would you like a knighthood if it was offered to you? Yes, I think I would actually. Um, I, 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 not, not everybody would approve. A lot of people that I respect very highly have turned it down. But I think I would, I would accept it. I, I don't expect to get one. But, but um, well, Why don't you expect to get one? Um, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that. Could it be that, you know, the Queen is the head of the Church of England? And oh, no, I don't, no I, think, I don't think... Uh, your, I, you know, your views about no, religion? No, I don't think so. No. I, I, I think if there's any opposition, it probably wouldn't come from the Queen, but, but, but I don't know. Do you sometimes envy physicists? Because you do um, talk quite a bit about physics. You obviously yes. know quite a bit about it. Yes. Do you envy them that they don't have to constantly defend their profession against all kinds of oh, social arguments? Um, <laughs> I've come across the phrase physics envy, you know, a sort of play on, on the Freudian phrase. Um, uh, not for that reason, though. I mean, not because they don't have to def defend themselves so much, but because physics is so fascinating. I mean, so, I mean, I, I wish I was mathematical enough to, to, to understand the more recondite um, aspects of, of physics. Um, you're right that biology, especially my own field of evolutionary biology, is in the frontline trench of controversy, especially in the United States. Actually, cosmology is not far behind. Um, surprisingly, the Big Bang um, doesn't get a good press with fundamentalists. You think it would because it sort of sounds superficially rather like Genesis, mm. but um, they, they don't seem to like it very much. If you were to have another profession instead of being a biologist or an evolutionist, what, what, what do you think you would uh, like to Maybe be? Maybe computer scientist. You did spend a lot of time. Yes, I did. I mean, it, that that's comes across in both volumes of my autobiography, um, both An Appetite for Wonder and Reef Candle in the Dark. I'd, I've done a lot of computer programming in an amateurish sort of way. I am intrigued by it. And it's not that 
far removed from modern biology, actually. I mean, in many ways, because DNA is digital, not just digital, it's very, very like um, computer uh, Compute computer science. It's very, um, it's, it's quaternary rather than binary, but apart from that, um, a, a computer scientist could walk straight into modern molecular genetics. Let's say you've got 10 more years of good writing and good research ahead of you. What are you going to focus on? <laughs> um, well, I, I have two foundations, charitable foundations. The Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, one in Britain and much more active one in America, and I'm very keen on the, what we're doing in America, um, promoting reason and science. Um, things like Openly Secular, the campaign to, um, to get Americans to realize that uh, you don't have to be religious in order to be a good citizen, to get elected to Congress, to get elected president and things like that. So the Openly Secular campaign is um, working to get people to, um, to come, come out and say, I am openly secular, I am a doctor, I am a bus driver, I am a nurse, um, I'm a fireman, and I'm openly secular. Um, so that, that's the kind of thing that my American foundation is doing, and various other things as well. Um, as for future books, um, I don't normally think very far ahead. Uh, I think my next book might possibly be another collection of essays, a bit similar to um, A Devil's Chaplain, which I published in about um, 2004. Um, and I pr probably might do that next, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank Appreciate you. It.